Well, hello, everyone, wherever you may be. My name is Michael Kugelman, I'm the Asia Program Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia with the Wilson Center. Thank you for joining us today for this very important discussion. We will be hosting a conversation with Christina Lamb, the author of the new book, Our Bodies, Their, ba Their Battlefield, What War Does to Women. This event marks the concluding event of a Wilson Center series held in recognition of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. This international campaign has run from November 25th through December 10th today, which is International Human Rights Day, and it recognizes the right of women around the world to live free from fear and violence. I would like to uh, commend the Wilson Center team that has been leading this effort over the last 16 days, specifically Beatrice Nice, Anya Prusa, and uh, Olivia Soledad have played key roles in this event today, uh, and they and their colleagues have done so well producing the earlier events as well. And the Wilson Center products emerging from this campaign have been exceptional. You can see these earlier events and other content uh, on our website at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, so Christina Lamb is a Wilson Center Global Fellow. She's one of Britain's leading foreign correspondents and a best-selling author. She began as a correspondent in South Asia, the region that I study, and she's since been posted in many corners of the globe, if not all corners of the globe, and produced a number of acclaimed books, including uh, Farewell Cobble, which is a book that we launched here at the Wilson Center about four years ago, uh, as well as uh, I Am Malala, which she co-authored with Malala Yousafzai. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Katie Stallard Blanchett, who will be moderating this event. Katie is also a Wilson Center uh, Global Fellow. She was previously a Wilson Center Fellow in residence. Like Christina, she is a very respected, longtime uh, foreign affairs journalist and correspondent. She was previously with Sky News as its Asia Bureau Chief. And she will soon be publishing her first book entitled Dancing on Bones, History and Power in China, Russia, and North Korea. So it really is terrific to have two Wilson Center fellows, both great journalists and thought leaders convening for this uh, very difficult but very important discussion. So with that, Katie, I turn things over to you and I look forward to uh, your conversation with Christina. Over to you, Katie. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, let me start by saying I'm really proud to be part of this initiative uh, for activism against gender-based violence. Uh, it, it could not be more important programming or a more appropriate day uh, to bring you this event. Uh, and I'm honored uh, to be part of this conversation with Christina Lamb. Um, as Michael outlined uh, some of Christina's uh, extraordinary accolades, um, she's also a journalist I personally greatly admire. Um, she is as intrepid as they come. She has been uh, reporting from front lines around the world for the last three decades, uh, but as well as covering what journalists tend to refer to uh, as the bang bang of war zones, uh, Christina really brings us the stories of the people who live through these conflicts and the lives and the suffering uh, that, that will go on long after the international spotlight uh, has moved on. And it's very much in that vein uh, that she brings us this latest book, Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, War Through the Lives of Women, which focuses on rape and sexual violence as a weapon of war, uh, an issue which is sorely underreported and often missing uh, from our history books. Uh, so I want to join, jump straight in. Um, please do send us your questions. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. You can either tweet them to us uh, using the hashtag gender at Wilson, uh, that's hashtag gender at Wilson, or you can send them via email to brazil at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, so Christina, thank you so much for joining us uh, here this afternoon, this evening. I, I think it is your time. Uh, let me ask firstly how you got involved with this subject. What drew you to uh, report what, what really must have been a very, very difficult subject both to, to report and write here? Thanks, Katie, and thanks to Michael and, and the Wilson Centre for, for hosting this and for holding this series, which, as Katie said, is really important. And I'm thrilled to be um, part of it and also to be talking to Katie, a journalist that I really admire. So probably enough mutual <laughs> admiration. Um, but um, how I came about focusing on this was basically I have been um, a foreign correspondent mostly covering conflict for 33 years. I started when I was very young um, and I've always I think 
perhaps because I'm a woman, um, when I started, there were many other women in the field. I always focus very much on what happened to women in conflict. I've never really been that interested in the fighting, but always much more how people carry on living during a conflict, because, you know, even if you take Syria today, where they've been at war now for nine years, there's still millions of people carrying on with their lives, going to work, getting married, having children. Um, and mostly it seems to me that the people who are organizing that carrying on of life when all hell is breaking loose around them and protecting and educating their children and sheltering the elderly are the women. And to me, that's uh, least as heroic as the fighting in a war. So that's always been my main interest. But I have to say that there's also a dark side of what happens to women in war, and that's the use of sexual violence. Um, there's always, of course, been rape in war. If you go back to the sort of ancient Greeks and Romans, um, there was always um, abduction of women, the very first written history by Herodotus opens with the abduction of women by the Phoenicians and the Trojans. Um, but it seems to me that in recent years it's being used much more as a weapon. And I really first came across it on a big scale uh, with the Yazidis who, as you know, were um, taken uh, by ISIS fighters from their homeland in Iraq. Um, many of the women were taken as sex slaves and taken slave markets and uh, went through the most horrendous things. So I met a group of these Yazidis who had escaped um, and I met them on a Greek island in 2016 or 2015 rather, and they just told me the most horrendous stories of what had happened to them. And I was just absolutely so shocked. And, and then all around the same time, I was traveling to Nigeria a lot because you might remember the Chibok girls, more than 200 girls that were taken from their school in the middle of the night by Boko Haram fighters and then uh, and there was a lot of outrage and I went to report on that but actually found that tens of thousands of girls and women were being abducted and forced to be so-called bushwives of Boko Haram and then um, a couple of years after that in 2017 I was reporting on the Rohingya crisis and the um, around 700,000 Rohingya that fled from um, Burma or Myanmar into Bangladesh, uh, many of them women, and all of them telling me just the most horrendous stories of how they were taken by um, Burmese soldiers and also Buddhist militias and tied to banana trees and gang raped often in front of their children. So I just became very shocked why this seemed to be happening on such a scale and started um, talking to people about it and looking into it more and more. How much of an issue do you think is the nature of war changing? I mean, in your experience, covering conflict, are we seeing conflicts fought in different places? Are we seeing different people being involved? Is that why we're seeing rape as a weapon of war in, in these in these mm. modern conflicts? Well, I thought a lot about, you know, why, I mean, first of all, of course, you know, is it happening more? Is it just that we're more aware of it and people talk about it more openly? But I am absolutely convinced that it's happening more um, because I have always talked to people about these issues and, and just the scale that uh, on some of these. Um, but you're right. I mean, in just the time that I've been working, we the wars tend to be less between states now and more movements, whether they're ideological movements or religious movements or militias. Um, so there's perhaps less respect to any kind of rules of, of war. And also the fighting is often much more in um, urban areas and in civilian areas. So if you look at the the percentage of civilians killed in conflicts over the last hundred years is, has gone up enormously. 
And so this is very much part of the whole issue of civilians being caught up in conflict. This is what's happening to women. And it has to be said, it's a very effective weapon. Yeah, I wonder if you could elaborate on that, what you found from your reporting on, on the purpose, the function of rape and sexual violence as, as weapons of war. Well, I, I think two things. I mean, one, it's very cheap. Um, it's cheaper than the price of a Kalashnikov bullet. And um, the other thing is it is very effective because if you're trying to humiliate an enemy or clear an area and you go in and rape the women and girls and also, you know, often this is being done in really horrendous ways and like setting fire to women's vaginas and raping tiny children, um, really, you know, unspeakable acts. Um, and it completely decimates a community because then the men feel that they can't protect their women. Um, often um, people will then flee the area. So one area uh, that I looked at where it's being used a lot, for example, is in the Democratic Republic of Congo because you have all these militias fighting to control um, very lucrative minerals, minerals that we use in things like our mobile phones and our <laughs> laptops. Um, and so if they want to control an area and they go in and, and start raping all, all the women and girls, it's an effective way uh, of clearing the area. But people do it for different reasons. I mean, in some of these conflicts, it's uh, religious motivation. In some, it's ethnic, where they're trying to ethnically cleanse, as we saw um, in Bosnia in the 90s, which I think for many of us, when we think about sexual violence in conflict, that's the sort of first time that people really became aware of it as a, a, a major weapon. And at the time, you know, there was outrage and people said, you know, rape camps in the center of Europe, how can this possibly be happening? And it must never happen again. And I mean, it's a crime that, that continues long after the ordeal itself is over, hasn't it? Can you give us a sense of, I guess, the, the extent to which the stigma lives with these women and they continue to suffer long after they've escaped their captors? Well, that's one of the most shocking things about this. I mean, rape is a crime anyway, where women often feel that uh, rather than the, the victim that they are, that they're being seen as somehow to, to blame for what happened. Uh, which is obviously completely wrong. And in these cases, I mean, um, often the women are not able to go back to their community because they are ostracized and stigmatized. I think one of the saddest cases is, is Nigeria. Uh, when I went there and found all these thousands of girls um, who'd been taken by Boko Haram, and they'd escaped or they'd been rescued by Nigerian military. But the soldiers who had rescued them had often then raped them again. Then when they went to the camps, uh, the camps are all organized by community and their communities wouldn't take them back. So they had no way of supporting themselves. Uh, the only way that they could survive was to actually sleep with the camp officials to get supplies. So these poor, and you know, you're talking about girls of maybe 13, 14, these girls are being punished over and over again. And, and some of them actually just went back to Boko Haram because they thought it was better than um, the life when they fled. So that is just terribly sad. Yeah, and you mentioned there are also problems for the children who are born out of, out of this rape. What, what happens to, to the children here? Yeah, I mean, that's something that people often don't think about. This was a, an issue in, in, in Bosnia. A lot of um, children were born um, in Rwanda. Um, also, uh, it was um, a big issue because the for the women um, where these children have been born from rape, you know, they've often been born out of the worst experience of these women's lives. And so um, it, it can be very difficult for them to accept the, the children. And some of them told me they wanted to kill their children. Um, and these kids, of course, are completely innocent. They don't know. And often they didn't find out till quite much later on 
why it was that they seemed to be treated differently to, to other, other children. So that's a major issue. And I mean, we're seeing at the moment with the Yazidis that although their um, faith leader, um, uh, Baba Sheikh, who sadly recently passed away, um, was persuaded to make a statement and welcoming them back to the community and, and saying, look, these women didn't do anything wrong. And actually it, it there it's an honor to marry one of these women who were taken and so that was actually very important but he didn't say that the children should be welcomed back so what has happened is that many of these girls had children with the isis captors and they're being forced into this terrible decision of whether they go back to their community and leave the children behind or if they stay with the children they can't go back and no woman should have to make that choice. Right. And I mean, you you paint uh, very vivid pictures in this book of, of the conditions that women are are living in after these ordeals. And you, you open up with women who are Yazidi women who are talking to you in, in the ruins of a, an abandoned asylum, who are sleeping in a, a camp within a camp protected by, by barbed wire because they're in danger within that camp. I guess, what is the message you'd like people to understand about the need to sustain interest and attention in this. I think with the case of the Yazidis, there were, there were a couple of weeks when, when this was really in headlines around the world, but how, how important is it that there's focus on this beyond the immediate outrage? Well, I really feel for the Yazidis in particular because they did speak out about what happened to them. And, you know, it, these it's really, really difficult to talk about these ordeals and what they went through. I mean, one 16 year old girl I met who'd been taken by an ISIS, fat ISIS judge and tied to the bed and raped by him every night. She said to me that the worst night of her life was when he brought back a 10 year old girl and raped the 10 year old in the room next door and she could hear the girl crying for her mother all night. And, you know, these are stories just, I, I spent most of my life reporting on bad people, sadly, but these are the worst stories that I have ever heard. Um, and in fact, you know, it, very hard for that girl to tell me the story. And I said to her, are you sure you want to continue? And she said, and she looked at me really fiercely and she said, absolutely, because I don't want anyone to be able to say they didn't know. And that was why I collected all these stories. I collected stories from 12 different countries, but on five continents. But honestly, I could have spent the rest of my life, I think, doing this because it's happening on such a wide scale. And I feel bad for the Yazidis because they have spoken out and told people what happened. And they thought that there would be some action as a result of that. And instead, nothing has happened. Not a single ISIS fighter. Thousands of Yazidi girls were taken and kept as sex slaves. And lots of the ISIS fighters are now in captivity and are being tried. But not a single one is being tried for what they did to the Yazidis. They're being tried for terrorism charges. Um, same with Boko Haram in Nigeria, there's not been a single prosecution. The same with the Rohingya. Um, and that is the, the, the shocking thing about all of this. Yes, there has always been rape in war, but we are in the 21st century. It is a war crime and it is so difficult to get justice. And there just doesn't seem to be enough attention on the issue or enough help given. And so, you know, we made a fuss about the Yazidi girls and about the Chibok girls, but, you know, all these years on, they're still living in camps with very bad conditions and no sign of, of any justice being given to them. What could help them to get justice? What, what are the major barriers standing in the way of justice? And I guess also what would justice look like well, that's an important question. I mean, every woman I spoke to in every place pretty much told me that what they wanted was justice. But I think that that means different things to different people. Not all of them did it mean that they 
um, actually wanted a, a trial and to see their perpetrator convicted and put behind bars. In some cases, what they really wanted was actually acknowledgement of what had happened to them and that they didn't do anything wrong, that somebody had done bad to them. So, and, and also, you know, that they needed help because in many of these places there's no counselling. As I said, they're often ostracised in the community, so they have no uh, way of making a living and they end up um, destitute and living in terrible conditions, all because somebody did something terrible to them. So it's extremely sad. And um, the, the justice side is just so frustrating because actually, you know, if you go back a bit in the last century um, and go back, there's been a lot of talk recently about Nuremberg trials because it's the 75th anniversary. And so, yeah, this was the first time that um, war crimes were tried on an international tribunal um, after the Second World War. Uh, we know that um, hundreds of thousands, perhaps as many as two million women in Germany and Central Europe were raped by the Soviet forces who came in to liberate Berlin. Um, there are many accounts of this. Um, and it was never even mentioned at the Nuremberg trials. So, you know, the, the international community needs to do more. Bosnia, which I mentioned in the 90s, where there was outrage and um, President Clinton and many people all spoke about how terrible this was and should never happen again. Um, actually, if you go to Bosnia and talk to the women, very few of the perpetrators, very few of the rapists have been um, convicted. There was actually just last week, um, after 26 years, uh, conviction of a, a couple. But um, some of the women that I spoke to told me that they see their rapists all the time, that they bump into them in coffee shops, that they are still working in the police force. And, you know, this is quite... Um, hard to understand considering that there was an international tribunal set up. Um, so it really does seem that, and um, actually uh, there's this amazing woman um, in Bosnia who set up, she became so frustrated, her name is Bakira, uh, that she set up an association for women who were victims and um, they started taking things into their own hands and trying to track down the people who'd done these things to them. And then she told me that she knew every extension in the prosecutor's office and the international tribunal, and she would just phone every single person until she got somebody to, to take notice of these things. And they, these women managed to get about 100 men convicted, which is just amazing. Um, so there are some incredible people out there doing things and taking things into their own hands, but justice really seems to me to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, and some of the women that I spoke to, I went to the last surviving comfort women um, who were taken by the Japanese army during the Second World War. Again, very young when they were taken, most of them hadn't even started their periods. Um, and uh, these women were kept forcibly as prostitutes for the Japanese soldiers and raped endlessly um, and then were, were not able to talk about it for a long time. Um, and, you know, so this happened more than 70 years ago and they still don't have justice. And not only do they not have justice, but the ones I went to speak to in the Philippines, um, their history books don't even mention what happened to them. There is no acknowledgement. Um, and they raised money to be able to erect a statue in honor of the comfort women in Manila the um, year before last. And the government took it down within four months because they didn't want to offend the Japanese who provide a lot of aid. <laughs> It's awful. I mean, let me just remind our viewers uh, before we go on to, to send us your questions. If you, you'd like to ask a question to Christina directly, uh, you can uh, tweet us using the hashtag gender at Wilson, or you can send questions direct via email to brazil at wilsoncenter.org. It's brazil at wilsoncenter.org. Um, as you describe some of these women, Christina, I, I want to be clear that you 
the women in your book are not solely women as victims. These are also women who, as you point out, are, are, are fighting and are demanding justice. Uh, can you give us a sense of what you've seen works in terms of yeah. initiatives that, that, that women are, are running in many cases themselves? Well, these women, as you say, are, they are incredibly brave um, women and um, there, I gave you the example of Bakira in Bosnia running this organization to track down some of the perpetrators, um, but there have uh, other women who've done remarkable things towards getting justice. So actually, um, people often don't realize, I certainly didn't realize until I started looking into all this, that the first place in the world where rape was actually convicted as an international war crime was Rwanda. Um, and that was the international tribunal that was set up in Arusha to look into what had happened. And that is really the result of some incredibly brave women that risked their lives to go and testify. Um, one of them, her husband and um, son were killed to try and kind of put her off speaking. And actually, if you look at that trial, which was of the mayor of Tarba, a small town outside of the capital, Kigali, um, whose name was Jean-Paul Akayesu, he actually was not initially on trial for sexual violence. He was on trial for other um, crimes. And one of the women testifying said something uh, about and then he raped me <laughs> so um what the prosecutor literally said well you know moving on from that <laughs> we're not interested in that and fortunately one of the three international judges on on the bench was um an amazing south african judge called navi pile who had been very involved in dismantling the apartheid laws and she when she heard that, she said, well, hang on a minute, what do you mean you when he raped me? And so what rape? So then the woman said, well, lots of people were being raped in the, the town hall. Um, so that led to the whole trial then eventually being stopped and um, new charges framed, which in included um, sexual violence or responsibility for sexual violence. Um, and then women came and testified about what had happened to them. Um, and in 1998, they got this um, historic conviction. But if you go and talk to those um, women today, there were five of them and four surviving. They live in absolutely miserable conditions. These are women that changed international legal history. Um, living in huts with no electricity, scraping a living. Um, and, uh, but they don't regret what they, they did. They feel what they did was important, but they're really shocked that it hasn't made much difference. They said to me when they heard about what was happening to the Yazidis, they couldn't really understand it because they thought well, we went and testified and risked our lives and what people thought of us because we were trying to stop this. And so why is it still happening? So how much of a difference do you think it makes when women are represented, when they are prosecuted, when they're, when they're prosecutors rather, when they're judges, when they're part of the, the system that's responding to these crimes? That's a really good question. I mean, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, as you know, died sadly recently, said women belong in all the places where decisions are being made. And I believe that very strongly because in this is a very good example because every case I found, and there have been successes um, recently in domestic courts, the, we have to say the International Criminal Court in 20 years has only convicted one person for sexual violence last year. And that's it, which I think is appalling considering the widespread use of it around the world. But anyway, um, the every case I found where there had been success for a successful conviction. Um, there had been a woman on the bench, a woman judge or a woman prosecutor. So it you know, clearly shows that there need to be more women represented in courts and 
I, I actually think personally it starts with um, peacemaking because uh, 20 years ago, the UN, every country in the UN voted a re resolution called 1325, which was to um, make sure that women had more representation in um, in peacemaking and negotiations and also peacekeeping and that they should be protected against sexual violence in conflict. And, you know, the progress has been very poor. I think that um, if you look at all the, the um, peace negotiations in that 20 years, half of them don't even mention women. If you look at what's going on around the world today, there isn't a single peace process headed by a woman, even though every study you look at, it was one recently by the Council for Foreign Relations in New York, finds that um, peace negotiations are more successful if women are involved. And um, current negotiations, if you look at Yemen, there are no women involved in the recent negotiations and military negotiations in Libya, there were no um, women and in Afghanistan and ongoing negotiations between civil society and the government um, and the Taliban, there are only four women. Um, so, and they, they're risking their lives, they're having death threats. And so, you know, it starts with that because I think if you don't have women sitting there when um, peace negotiations are going on, um, it really does seem as though the men don't take this issue as seriously. And I saw an example of this in Iraq. I went to the chief justice of the courts that are trying the ISIS fighters. And, and it, it's kind of not justice quite as we know it. You know, people are being convicted within 20 minutes, sometimes given death sentences. Um, and I said to him after spending a day watching, um, have any of the people that you've been um, have had in your court uh, had Yazidi women as sex slaves? And he said, yes, a lot of them. So I said, but why aren't there any charges for this? And so he just looked at me baffled and he said, but why would we do that? They were killing people and that's much more important. And I said to him, but for the women that went through this, don't you understand that this is actually almost all the women I spoke to told me that they would rather have died than go through what they did. So to say that this is something that doesn't matter is completely wrong. Anyway, he just he couldn't understand. <laughs> it's just shocking. Um, let me give you a question from uh, Leon Weintraub. Uh, who asks this, uh, do you get the sense that rape was in earlier years seen as part of the spoils of war as something quote earned by the victors, but it's increasingly occurring as a specific tactic as part of war fighting? Yeah, I do. That, that's a, a good question. I do think that. I mean, certainly, you know, if you go back to ancient times, then people were, were either being able to rape women because of just the general chaos of war and the breakdown of, of law and order, or they were being rewarded for um, their fighting. And, um, and so it was very much the spoils of war. But um, in recent times, and the, the kind of things that I've been covering, um, these are uh, situations where people were actually fighters of being ordered to um, carry out rape. So the ISIS fighters that took the Yazidi women were told that it was their religious duty, that the Yazidis were devil worshippers and they should be taken as slaves. And they even produced pamphlets, which were, you know, how to like guidelines for keeping your, your slave. And, and there was paperwork. Um, I've seen some of the things almost as if people were buying and selling a car for when they were trading the, the girls. And I mean, I met one girl who was traded 12 times and she said she felt like a goat just being passed from, from one to another. So definitely these are cases where, where people are actually being told to do it. I mean, it the same thing in um, Rwanda, the Serbs were, because it was mostly the Bosnian Muslims who were um, the victims, um, were trying to change the ethnicity 
um, also saw that in, in Rwanda. Um, if you go back to uh, Bangladesh in 1970-71, where the Pakistani army came in, and at that point the country was still part of Pakistan and was fighting to be independent, and um, many, many women were raped by Pakistani army who were, were trying to change the Bengali identity and make it more Punjabi. And there's, again, were given kind of religious, so-called religious basis for why they should do that. Shocking. Um, I feel like I, I'm going to respond to everything you say here with various forms of that's shocking, that's awful. I mean, it's just <laughs> devastating to hear example after example. Um, around the world on this. Um, let me ask you this from Michelle Van Aken. Um, she says, are you concerned that increased reporting on and awareness of the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war, particularly through social media fields, feeds, has in some way contributed to the increase in its use? Mm. Um, I think that, you know, maybe sometimes you get that uh, copycats um, from from reporting things, but I think it more important. It's so underreported at the moment that it, it is at the, we're in a situation where we need to get the word out that this is happening so much. And um, every woman that I spoke to wanted people to know that this was happening to them, and that uh, hoping that actually things would change as a result of that awareness and, and you know I have personally I have to say I until this year I've only ever had male editors all my reporting life which is shocking I think all the uh, news editors all the foreign editors I reported to were always male and I really struggled to get stories about this into my newspaper because they felt it wasn't something readers wanted to know about. Yeah, so I guess it's an argument for also female representation there and to be able to file these stories and, and have them have them received and, and published. What, what do you feel that has now changed that there is no greater receptiveness to reporting on this? I think it's still massively underreported considering, you know, it's happening in so many places. Um, I mean, sadly, one, of, I'm obviously a foreign correspondent, but one of the things I think is an unfortunate side effect of, of the pandemic is that we've all become much more focused on our own domestic situation because we're all going through something terrible and there's much less interest in what's happening outside and so foreign coverage has been cut back a lot and I hope that that isn't a long-lasting thing so you know as we speak uh, Mozambique for example has um, in north of Mozambique there is um, lot of fighting and more than 500,000 people have fled jihadists that have moved in there and they have been taking um, girls as sex slaves and you know there's very little reporting of this um, in Belarus where people have bravely been coming out every week since the elections against um, what is seen as Europe's last dictator um, Again, there has been use of sexual violence um, against the women and very little reporting of it. So um, I would like to see this being talked about a lot more and, and more done about it, you know, but awareness is the beginning. Um, so Anne Moisen asks, uh, why has the RTP a responsibility to protect not been used to address this violence? What concerns do you have with Russian and Chinese efforts to remove the quote gender and quote protection of women from UN resolution 1325 considerations? What can be done? Yeah, uh, well, that is concerning. I mean, they haven't been successful, fortunately. And, you know, to be frank, uh, it's not been helped over the last few years um, having in the White House somebody who himself had been accused of um, various um, assaults and 
um, harassment of women. Um, if you're trying to persuade people around the world and um, dictators and things to try and do something about it in their countries, uh, that's not an ideal example. So I think there is a lot of hope that the the changes coming in the US will um, will actually, I mean, I know that um, Joe Biden will have a lot of things to <laughs> deal with, but this may not be the top of his list, but certainly just the change and having a woman in the White House as vice president and somebody who herself has um, kept, spoken out about um, the need to prosecute against sexual violence and bring justice, um, I think actually will really be very important around the world. And it was, for me, fascinating during the election, like everybody, I was absolutely um, glued to my TV watching what was happening on CNN. Um, but I was getting messages from women, WhatsApp messages from women I'd met in places like um, the Congo or Bosnia or South Sudan also really excited and feeling that this might lead to changes for them. I don't remember ever an election having that kind of impact around the world. Do you have any sense that this is becoming more of an international priority? And I guess what would your message be to the incoming administration here in the United States about the power of international leadership? Is this an area where it can really have an effect on the ground? not just in, in grand words. Yeah. Well, you know, nothing I think is going to change unless there is real um, focus of powerful people on it. Um, you, Yes, you've got all these brave women on the ground who are fighting years to try and bring cases and occasionally su succeeding, but it's a very, you know, just very small, um, percentage of the total. Um, so for things to really change, it, it needs international leadership. And I think that it is possible to, first of all, you know, to make it quite clear that this is completely unacceptable in the 21st century, that this is, is going on, that it's not something that should be happening. Plenty of the countries where this is happening are countries that receive a lot of aid internationally. And that could obviously be used as a, a tool to persuade people who are not going to give you aid unless you make um, some attempt at, at the very least to, to do something about this and, and start um, trying to bring people to justice and also, you know, people uh, within your own army or police force um, who, and if you look at the most recent um, report from Pramila Patton, the UN Special Representative for Sexual Violence in Conflict, um, you know, they list every year all, all of the um, different armed groups and um, militias, but also often armed forces and police forces that are involved in this, uh, where they have evidence. And they only list the ones where they have uh, plenty of evidence, but even so, it's uh, actually quite astonishing number. And so that, you know, it's not, an, they, may, they put out these reports, which are very shocking, but uh, more needs to actually be done about what they're finding. Let me ask you this from Shane Carter from the University of California, Berkeley, um, who asked, and this is something you've touched on already. Um, do you think it's possible that historical narratives about rape being a, quote, spoil of war is just another way of erasing rape as a tactic from historical narratives? It's hard to imagine this is really a new method when we consider how frequently rape was always a, a part of war. Yeah, I mean, rape was always a part of war, but um, that doesn't mean that it's, you know, something acceptable in the 21st century. I think that we have moved on from then. Um, and I do feel very strongly that in um, all these cases that I go into in my book, there were where rape was actually 
used as a weapon and people were specifically told to go and ordered to go and rape people. It wasn't a question of it just happening in the, in the general chaos. It was really something that was being used as a, a major part of their strategy. We should also just be clear, um, as you write in the book, that rape is not something that is only happening to women who are poor or women who don't have a formal education. Can you talk a little bit about it, the case you, you, you write about in Argentina, where these are women who, yeah. who did have resources and means? Yeah, and also, I mean, we should say it's not only happening to women, um, it is used against men, and that's even more taboo, uh, really difficult for people to talk about, and uh, used in places like some of Assad's prisons in Syria, if you talk to people who have managed to get out of there, I mean, just horrific stories of uh, male sexual abuse, so... Um, but uh, personally, I, I was writing a book about women, so I focused on on that. But um, I think there's probably an, another book <laughs> there for somebody to do. Um, but the yeah, I mean, it, I guess it's easy to often think, oh, well, these things are happening in far away places, poor places where there are civil wars and. Um, and I was in Argentina um, while I was researching this book, but actually I was there to, to speak at a journalism event. And so I stayed in Buenos Aires a few days and at the dinner, I was talking to a lawyer and saying that I was working on this book. And um, she said, well, that's fascinating because do you know what's happening here at the moment? Um, and I said, no, what do you mean? And she said, well, actually, we are now finding that all the lots of the women that were taken during the dictatorship in the late 70s and early 80s, so 30 years ago, um, or more than 30 years ago, uh, were actually um, raped and it, you know it's never been part of any of the trials even though that they have had um, and actually you know if you go to um, some of the torture centers in Argentina which I did visit including the biggest one ESMA um, and they've turned them into really fascinating and very chilling museums and talk about the torture that was um, inflicted on people. And this was the dictatorship um, picking people up from the streets who they saw as communists, as left wing subversives. Um, many of them were uh, university students or lecturers or lawyers or unionists. Um, and then these people were taken and tortured and a lot of them were killed uh, or so-called disappeared and put on these death flights. So I knew about that and had reported about that and also the horrific thing where um, some of the people that were picked up who were pregnant were then delivered to their babies and then the babies were taken by the, the people who were keeping them captive and brought up as their own children, and, which is really chilling and a bit um, reminiscent, I guess, of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale. Um, in fact, I think she says that that actually gave her the inspiration. So, um, so I knew about all of that side, but I didn't know that women had been taken and raped and also kept as sex slaves. And so then I um, met some of these women. I met one, Graciela, who um, told me that when she read about what happened to the Yazidis, she thought, oh my God, this is exactly what happened to me, except I was in Buenos Aires in a city and they were in the desert in Iraq and Syria. Um, and so she'd been um, taken off the streets, taken to a torture center, kept there. And then this colonel had taken a fancy to her and, um, and kept her as basically his um, sex slave and used to, the whole thing was very chilling. He used to take her out to restaurants and like make her dress up and make her up. And then, and then she'd have to go back to the um, prison <laughs> afterwards. Um, 
And so she, finally now these cases are, are coming out. And it wasn't, when I talked to people, it wasn't that people didn't know about it at the beginning. Some of the women tried to speak out about it in earlier cases, but again, we're told that this isn't relevant. This isn't what we're interested in. We're only interested in the torture and killing as if it was somehow something that didn't matter. And so they've had to live for years with that kind of shame that what happened to them, this terrible thing, was something that they couldn't speak about. What do you find is the reaction to these women seeing their stories in print, hearing them reported? Does that help to dispel some of this shame? Well, they all spoke out because they wanted people to know and they wanted things to, to change. Um, and in a way, I mean, it was a kind of self-selecting group because I spoke to people who were already trying to get justice or who were somehow, you know, activists in this. Um, um, there are obviously many, many more women who um, are, are terrified of, of speaking out because, you know, um, that's what was so interested in, in Buenos Aires. Here were these women who actually were educated, affluent, had access to lawyers and media and um, resources, and yet still hadn't spoken out for all these years. So imagine in a, a place where people don't have, where women are from a, a poor place, maybe illiterate, and don't have access to any of these things. And on top of that, often the, the very people perpetrating these crimes are the people running the country or running their area or have the weapons. So it's really impossible for them to get any kind of justice without international help, I think. Another question here, do you feel that governments might be hesitant to prosecute these rape crimes because of anxiety that the spotlight might come around to focus on what their own soldiers might have done? Well, that is very interesting. And actually, I didn't, because I was writing about rape as a weapon of war, I only really touched on this issue of um, peacekeepers um, taking advantage of the situation that they're in and, um, and raping people. We've also even seen, you know, charity workers in, in some places, aid workers, um, doing some of these things which is just you know awful that here are people that are supposed to be there to protect the local population and, and help them and then taking advantage in in that way um, it destroys any kind of trust so uh, I think I mean actually one of the things that the British military are doing which I think it is very good is they now have um, kind of modules in sexual violence in conflict as part of their training and um, when they do training for other countries which they they do a lot um, they also um, bring this in uh, a lot now so I think that's very important for militaries to be more aware um, and also, again, to have more female representation, because it's quite clear it happens less in militaries such as the Israeli army, which has uh, a much higher proportion of women. When we, uh, we talked previously, you, you mentioned your frustration that really so many of these groups helping women seem to be learning lessons discreetly apart from each other. Are there examples of one group discovering something that works and being able to share it with another? Or is there, is there, a, is there a space for, I guess, more, more of a joined up, coordinated yeah. response here? One of the frustrating things is, I mean, most major NGOs have got um, people looking at sexual violence, but there isn't an organization just focusing on this internationally. And so, and there are some very effective small local organizations doing amazing things, but they're just in a small area and they're, they're not communicating with each other. So I, um, and in my book, I was trying to, because I didn't want it to be all, you know, kind of doom and gloom, I was trying to find examples of people doing good things and found plenty. But 
it was frustrating because you'd find, for example, um, women from Srebrenica in um, Bosnia who found that one of the things that helped them was um, starting this whole project of growing roses. Um, and it was quite funny because they were given all these uh, things to grow, which were, the idea was they would then sell them and uh, make money. And then they didn't sell them because they all said, we really like the smell of the roses and sitting and drinking coffee together uh, with the roses. So then they were given more and now they, they, they sell them as well. And they found that very helpful and very healing. And they also um, produce tea. Um, and then, but that, took them about 10 years to to come to that and that was now um maybe 15 20 years ago that they started doing this then in congo there's a very good project called city of joy i mean there's a phenomenal hospital there called the pansy hospital which is run by a man called dennis McQuiggy, who is one of my absolute heroes and he won the nobel peace prize a couple of years ago for his work on trying to combat sexual violence his hospital has treated fifty-five thousand women and girls who have been raped um and the week that i spent there a six-month-old baby and a four-year-old girl were brought in who'd been raped. I mean, it was just horrible. And he is, again, someone risking his life. He's had uh, assassination attempts. And so he um, jointly with a woman called Christine Schuler uh, runs something called City of Joy, which is um, for women who have gone through these things and have um, been treated by his hospital but as he said he realized early on that physical repairing the physical damage was just the start of it that there was also what the mental trauma so he started then bringing in uh, psychotherapists um, but then he said that that wasn't enough because they'd often cast out of their villages so they also needed a way of making a living so they would give them training and then the fourth part of his program is giving them access to legal resources if they want to try and take action so he has this real model program I would say of um, but you know not everybody is able to put something together like that and City of Joy is this sort of sister thing where a small group of um, women who are treated in this hospital are then um, stay at this place for about six months and um, and basically learn to um, really be in control of their own story and to be um, learn leadership skills so that they can go back to their communities and try and make a difference. And but they were saying to me that one of the things that they'd found recently was really working well was um, get, taking women and girls back to nature and growing things and so they were kind of ended up doing what the women of Srebrenica had um, found was very helpful but this was sort of 15 years later and you just thought oh, if only these people had spoken to each other and said look we found this very helpful maybe you should try that but um, but Mc Dr. McQuiggy is trying to kind of create this survivors network where there would be more discussion between um, people in different places. So let me try and squeeze very briefly one last question in, which uh, I think is very, very fitting. This event is about activism against gender based violence. And uh, this questioner asks, how can people who are watching this at home help? That's a very good question. Well, I mean, first we just talk about it more. I mean, yeah, I know that these stories are difficult and uncomfortable, um, but it, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't um, care about it. On the contrary, it's not going to change until we do start speaking about it and making people aware of what's happening so first of all just talking about it more and also putting pressure on our own political leaders that um that this is something that matters and that we need to be doing something about it as i said you know a lot of these places don't have the resources they don't have the means 
to collect evidence, they don't have good um, justice systems, so they really need help in all of these things. Thank you so much. Well, we are uh, unfortunately out of time, but I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for writing uh, this very important book and thank you to everyone watching at home. Thank you very much for listening and thank you, Katie.